So Jim Spruill is a family medicine and urgent care physician and lives with his wife, Heather, in Bakersville. I'm sure some of you grow Heather Spruill. I do. Um, they raised four children, and everyone in the family has had a hand in helping Jim in his efforts to bring new roses to the public. He has been raising roses from seeds for nearly 30 years with a special interest in clean shrub roses. Thrive, a bright red shrub rose with glossy, disease-resistant foliage he bred, was introduced by Star Roses. With a love for, no for, for novelty roses, he has also bred Honey Dijon and the iconic Rose series. He's also done the Jolene Adams Rose. Um, and like I said, Heather Spruill, I'm sure many people grow that as a miniature. So without further ado, we'll be talking about a new path, a path to new roses, Jim Spruill. Thank you, thanks. Well, you all put on a pretty amazing show and um, a lot of hands really went into this uh, uh, conference and uh, just putting on everything, it's amazing. Um, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Joan and Alcina and, and uh, Gail helped as well and, and then John, you know, just putting all this together and all the technology and I don't know what I'm doing with the technology, so hopefully we'll, it'll work. Um, anyway, the, the program had said um, minis and mini floras and uh, as a rose breeder, uh, and some of you are, I've, I've met a few of you. Um, I could not limit myself to minis and mini floras. So I'm gonna kind of broaden that up a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, other things as well. So first we're gonna go to the next slide here and let's see if I can do this correctly. There, okay. So why roses? Um, I started out actually planting seeds like probably many of you have. You know, I, I've met a lot of gardeners, not just rose people, but gardeners. Um, when I was a kid, I, I liked planting seeds, any kind of seed. Uh, I loved finding out what came out of the little magical hard thing that you put in the ground. And when the root came out and then the, the stem, it was just amazing to me. Being interested in sciences too, I, I thought, uh, you know, what do you get when you cross this with that? And uh, I started out with peppers. My dad loved jalapeno peppers. He also liked serrano peppers. And so I thought, what do you get when you cross a jalapeno with a serrano? So you, you get an intermediate thing, something that's uh, hot uh, and kind of medium sized. Now, even though peppers are kind of fun, they're not near as exciting as roses. Uh, as you all know, roses are beautiful. Uh, they have lots of different colors. They're big, they're small single petal, multiple petals, stripes, and I'll talk a little bit more about the holothemias. In any case, um, what do you get when you cross a yellow rose with a pink rose? Or what do you get with, when you cross a red rose with a purple rose? Um, I know Gail Tremble uh, has done a great job. She's the first uh, award winner of uh, the, the Clean or the No Spray AOE Award for 2016. And so I, I think more and more we're leaning towards uh, clean roses. And so you, you have to think about that too when you're, when you're breeding roses. I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of mentors. Um, personally, I've had a lot of errors. I think you know, as you go along any path, uh, anything that you like to do, you probably learn as much from your mistakes as, and more so than from your successes. Uh, and because of that, I had to change my priorities in breeding. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, for those of, the, of you that maybe don't know about rose breeding, I'll mention a little bit about the procedure, how to do it. Um, as a uh, advocate for the Rose Hybridizers Association, I have to put in a plug there as well. So uh, you'll hear a little bit about that. And then I do wanna talk about the future of roses. Not that I can see the future, but I think some of us have some ideas about the future and we, we can share some of that. So first off, these are roses, and they're all different. And I like to show this slide whenever I talk just because it reminds me of the diversity that's out there. I think some of you grow many of these roses. Uh, do you know what they are? So I, so I heard the green rose, purple tiger, there's Danny Bess, and then the other one I don't think ever got a name. This is one of Mr. Moore's. 
No, it's actually one of Mr. Moore's, and I don't think it was introduced. Okay, it, and it might be. Uh, I, I got it as a numbered rose. Okay, all right. Um, in any case, these, these don't look to be the same thing, uh, but they are. They're, they're in the same species, and you can cross these things together. It's interesting to figure out what you might get. And so I have a few of my own that are also a little different. Um, this is one of the Hothemias, and this is a single. I've heard some people like stamens, and that's one thing that I really love too. And I think uh, yeah. five to ten, maybe fifteen petals shows that off the best. I like stripes. None of these have been named that I'm showing right now, um, but lots of diversity. You know, this this one has thrive in it, so I'm trying to get more cleanliness into the new roses coming along. Uh, but that's what really interested me in roses, and I'd like to as we're talking, just to think about maybe you guys would like to plant seeds too if you haven't tried it yet. It's another part of the hobby that's really, really fun. And so I do like to talk about mentors as well. You know, as a, as a doc, I've had mentors there and, and have really appreciated that. And the same is true with roses, and especially with rose breeding. Um, this is the rose Sam Trivet. Uh, Sam, uh, when we first uh, were in Bakersfield in our first house, he lived around the corner about three doors down. Uh, he was the silver medal honor recipient in the Southern California district. And a uh, really amazing man. Um, he introduced me to Tom Carruth uh, and then to others. And when I first started hybridizing roses, he tolerated me. Um, <laughs> I grew them in my garage, and uh, you know I'd, I'd always have some seedling that I was really proud of. And I'd take it down the street, knock on his door, and say, what do you think, Sam? And he'd smile and say, it's, it's pretty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he was actually more encouraging than that, but um, I, I know that, he, that they weren't really winners. Uh, in any case, uh, this last year, uh, Sam uh, joined me in the greenhouse and uh, helped me to look at some of the roses. And this is the first picture I got of him, even though I've known him for 25, 30 years. And then, so he introduced me to Tom Carruth. Uh, Tom Carruth uh, helped uh, me get started. He uh, evaluated several of my roses. This was the one they introduced, Honey Dijon. And uh, does anybody know what they used to call it? Baby poop, yeah, right. And some other names, too, that I won't repeat. <laughs> but um, in any case, I think Honey Dijon sells better. And then um, Mr. Moore, Mr. Ralph Moore, uh, really my most important mentor, a fantastic guy. Uh, Chris Warner is there with him. Chris came. Uh, I met Chris when we went uh, on a trip to England. Uh, the connection here between the two men is that both of them were very interested in the Holthemias, and, and I caught the bug from them. And they both um, allowed me to use some of their non-unnamed uh, 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 roses, uh, Holthemias, to use in my breeding program. So really great guys. Chris came over, uh, stayed with us for a couple of days, and then we went up to see Mr. Moore and just had a great time. One other thing about Mr. Moore, um, just that I really appreciated in him, was the, the imagination. Imagination was very, very important to him, and he maintained a great deal of uh, youthful imagination, even when he was in his, uh, when he was 100. He, he passed away at 102. But uh, I, I like to tell the story. I was with him um, one afternoon. We were having lunch together and talking about roses. Back up like three or four months, I'm with my daughter, we're looking at roses. And uh, she liked striped roses. And she knew I liked Holthemia roses. And she asked me, what do you think you'd get if you could cross a striped rose with a Holthemia rose? I thought, oh, that'd be cool. I got to try that. And so then back to this lunch time with Mr. Moore, um, we were talking roses, got to Holthemias, and he said, I wonder what stripes and roses and whole things would look like. So Mr. Moore had the same imagination as my 10-year-old daughter, so just a really amazing guy. And then uh, mentors, and then there's also the other parts, uh, people that grow the roses. Um, this is the rose field that was, uh, is Dan Waterhouse. He, he grows a lot, lot of roses for star roses. And uh, this is the, the field. 
um, where they test their roses. And I just want to point out, as you look at the field, you can probably notice to the right, there are quite a few roses that all look the same. Uh, I don't know if this pointer is going to work. Yeah, not that far, but anyway, those over there are some of the knockout series of roses. And I got to tell you, that's just a little tiny stripe of what they grow. They grow acres and acres of knockout, double knockout, sunny knockout, and so on. These are roses introduced by star roses. I was more excited, though, by these other roses over here on the left. You can see the smaller groupings, uh, maybe 10 to 20 each. These are new roses. These are baby roses. These are the future roses that you, you will maybe grow some of these. And uh, the other thing you'll notice when you're in a, in a uh, research block is they have the paths that you can walk to get a better look at them. Uh, in the production area, each one of these rows is full of roses growing. So uh, you really couldn't get down the paths. Now, I do want to point out the one in the, well, actually, I, I did want to have you guess which one might be mine first. And then, yeah, so the one in the middle is there. Um, and, th and that's the Thrive Rose. Uh, that's a few years ago. Uh, I was very excited they wanted to introduce that one. It turns out I work at Kaiser Permanente, and they, if you know the, the Thrive theme, uh, they were happy to and, uh, and liked the idea of naming this rose Thrive. And then there's the other help that you get um, as a rose breeder. These are my, this is my family. This is, uh, my wife is on the right, Heather Sproul. She's a pink rose too. And then Claire, my daughter, uh, uh, baby Claire. And I'll tell a little more stories about baby Claire later, but um, uh, this photo shows a, a baby Claire rose and uh, taken by Peter Alonzo. Has great form, it's a cute little rose. It was born the same year my daughter was born, so of course I wanted to name it baby Claire. Uh, I shouldn't have, and I'll tell you why later. This is Heather Sproul, and uh, this was also um, thanks to Peter Alonzo. I took the photo, but this bouquet is actually uh, a bouquet that he brought to a San Diego convention. And uh, he, he just told me, I, I gave him it as a, a test rose, and he said, you've got to name this rose. This rose needs a name. And my wife was there, and he's looking at her and smiling, you know. I thought, well, yeah, I got to name something after my rose, after my wife. So this became Heather Sproul. And don't want to neglect uh, my sons. These are my three sons, Lucas, Nathan, and Silas. This is our greenhouse, and they're helping me to plant. Um, they often help plant. I, I end up planting most of the seeds, but they're very involved and have been helpful. Uh, they've kind of left home now. Um, my daughter left about six weeks ago to go to college. My wife w was going to be here. Uh, she was lamenting the empty nest. And then about a week ago, my third son on the right there, Silas, he's married. He and his wife need some help. So they're moving back in with us, and my wife's kind of helping them move back in. So we'll have them for a few more months. OK, so what about some of the mistakes I've made? Is that a pretty rose? I think it's a pretty rose. And I, I think it actually needs to have a name. And I think it would probably be something that could show at the rose shows. Uh, you might notice the foliage is glossy. It's green. It's resistant to powdery mildew. We get tons of powdery mildew in Bakersfield. Uh, that was something I really hated when I first started growing roses. And I, I decided I am not going to have powdery mildew on my seedlings. And I learned from Tom Carruth not to spray the roses in the seedling beds. Um, I think a lot of people are tempted because you, you want to see what they're going to look like. But as far as I was concerned, I didn't want powdery mildew. Uh, it's true that some roses can grow out the tendency for disease a bit as they grow up. But um, roses that are resistant to powdery mildew when they're little tiny babies, they're going to be resistant and, and very resistant to powdery mildew when they're grown up. And this one was. Uh, and I won't be able to point to it, but on the lower petals, there's on the right side, there's a little black spot on that foliage. I don't know if you can see it, but this one gets black spot. I was keyed in on color and form, powdery mildew resistance, but I was lacking black spot resistance. 
I don't spray my roses inside or out. I do spray for spider mites, but n nothing for diseases. And this rose in the spring looks great unsprayed, but after that first bloom cycle, we get a bit of black spot because I have my pots all really jammed close together to try to promote disease, and it defoliates. So that's one of my pitfalls, is just looking at too few traits. You have to really look at more traits. The same is true of this one. Uh, this is one of my holothemias uh, from last year. It was growing in the seedling benches this time last year. And the blotch, as the rose matures, gets a lot bigger. I got to tell you, that's a really dark blotch for a baby holothemia, and I was really impressed by it. The problem was it was a little wimpy rose, kind of like pomegranate lemonade. If you, anybody grows that one, I apologize. It doesn't really thrive very much. Um, it has a good heat stable blotch, as does this one. This one I transplanted, I saved it, I should have thrown it out, but I transplanted it, put it in a pot, it's been outside, it hasn't done anything. It's just this little two or three sticks and has a white, nice white with a dark holothemia blotch on it. But for roses that you consider important steps in breeding, it's okay to do some of this because you can use it for further breeding. Um, and I think that's one of the messages that I'd like to, to get across if you're interested in doing rose breeding, is go ahead and use some as bridges. Uh, Mr. Moore was real big on using minis, bringing in other traits uh, to roses. His moss roses, striped roses, all of those kind of came through minis. I did want to show you, though, the comparison of this holothemia with the actual holothemia persica. Uh, you'll notice uh, this blotch is quite large, it, and uh, you have to do that through selective breeding. This is actually the Hulthemia persica. If you put that into Google, Wikipedia has this on their site. Uh, it's a, um, a common domain photo. Uh, the gentleman's name is Yuri, and this is in Kazakhstan. Notice the blotch. I think my blotch was bigger. <laughs> um, it wouldn't survive the desert, though. It would, it would die and die quick. Uh, so these, you can see, are in sand. Um, they are roses, in a sense. You can cross these with roses. Uh, what do you notice about them that's different from a rose? The foliage is kind of funny, isn't it? And if you look closely, you'll notice that there's no leaflets. There's just single leaves onto the stem. They have single leaves. And they don't have the oracles or the stipules that we talk about in roses. And then the third thing is this blotch. That's what makes them different. Now, another thing that makes them different is they, they are desert plants. And um, I had the opportunity to grow some of these from seed. And they're extremely difficult to grow them under rose conditions. They want a desert environment. So I'm going to try it one more time. I, I have a pot that has some just surviving. Um, interesting th a thing about them is that they have these underground root systems that um, send out laterals and then they have these little knobs uh, and up from those you can sprout a new plant. So you'll notice uh, in this photo some of the dead growth to the left there. Um, no doubt that was from last year's growth. Being a desert plant, you have to survive drought. And I think what they do is they have a problem with dieback. It's an adaptive change or a, a, an adaptation that they do to survive. But in roses, how many of you want roses that have great dieback? That's not a good trait. So that's something w that we've been fighting with um, in the Holothemias. And, and many of the modern ones don't, don't have that problem. But what I'm hoping that they'll retain is some of the drought resistance. And I've seen that in some of the seedlings. We've talked a lot about, you've heard a lot about water. Uh, the problem with uh, not being able to water the way we used to, people losing roses and so on. So this might be some help. So other pitfalls in rose breeding. And I put question marks after this one because this one, if you can recognize that, that's knockout. So that's the number one biggest seller of all time. Uh, so I can't really criticize this one with any pitfalls in terms of being a commercial success. On the East Coast, it's a fantastic rose. It has foliage all the way down, uh, blooms all season long. It's gorgeous. I've, I had looked at it in Pennsylvania where they get a ton of black spot. I was there, I think, in October, September, I think, around this time. And all of, all of the, almost all the other roses were just sticks. 
This one was not. It had petals that had great looking foliage and so on. But I didn't see it in the rose show. Maybe it was. Was it? No. Okay, it wasn't. And, and part of the problem is here in California, the first time I, I decided I have to have this rose. Uh, and so I bought one, I put it in the yard, and the first year it had powdery mildew. I thought there's no way in the world I'm gonna breed with this thing. I hate powdery mildew. Uh, so I, like most, maybe some of us, uh, I threw it away. I thought there's no way in the world I'm gonna use this thing. But a few years later, when I was in Pennsylvania and saw that, I thought, I have to bring this into my program. I can be hard on the powdery mildew. A lot of the seedlings of uh, knockout do get powdery mildew. They also get rust. So you have to s decide what you're going to cross it with. But um, this was a, in, in a very important bridge, a really important bridge. And, I, and I'm, I think we need to all be thankful to Will Radler for the work that he's done uh, with his genetics. So. Back to baby Claire, beautiful bloom. Uh, I have one plant of it surviving. Again, I don't baby any of my roses, not even baby Claire, my daughter's rose. Um, and here it is in the spring. Not much left of that rose. Fortunately, after it had all its leaves fall off, it sprouted out again and there's some good sprouts on it. And I still need to take some more cuttings this year of it. But you'll notice some of the other roses behind it. Do you see the foliage that's shiny and green and no disease? Some roses don't get disease. And so when you're breeding roses, especially if you're in a no-spray environment, uh, you're going to select for those better roses. This is another rose that I was pretty excited about. It doesn't get powdery mildew. Remember, I don't let them survive the babyhood for that. Um, this one was introduced, um, I think it was two years ago, as family holiday. Um, it has some exhibition potential. Uh, it has a quite very, there's a lot of variability in the color. Uh, it does have yellow and pink when it's uh, the right temperatures and sun exposure, but it can also be almost a pure white. Uh, the, again, great powdery mildew resistance. Uh, these are some photos that uh, Dave Bang uh, sent me. Uh, he's using it in breeding. It's a great uh, seed parent. You'll notice the foliage looks really pretty good there. I think he sprays with milk or something like that. I guess, do some of you do that? Apparently it works. Uh, in any case, it looks great there. So in my garden this spring, do you see those black spots? <laughs> it was covered. Uh, I had three plants of this because I thought you know, it sets hips well, lots of seeds per hip, it germinates fantastic, it has good form, it passes that on. It's pretty plastic in the color. You know, a lot of roses, you, you, you know, you end up when you cross a red with a yellow, you get all pink roses. So it's nice to have a rose that will give you lots of different variations, and this one does that. But um, after all these leaves fell off, um, it leafed out again, the foliage looked great, no powdery mildew. And it got a second round of black spot. And I, I just thought, there's no way I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to breed with this anymore. It's done. I, I've debated to throw out my three plants, but I've decided I'm going to put them around the garden just to promote the black spot. And that's all I'm going to use it for, is for black spot. It's a black spot magnet, unfortunately. So this rose, um, this is a seedling, unnamed. The photo was taken, I think it was the same day as the one I just showed you of um, uh, family holiday. And then and the same day, I, I, I took a bunch of pictures, uh, uh, baby Claire was on that same day. This foliage is shiny, it's green, it's dark, it has some form, it's pink. But interestingly enough, this one is, I think, three or four generations down from knockout. So you can select some of the traits if you're lucky and get them coming down the line and then you can get something a little bit better. So this one I'm trying to use, it's, it's also a little bit of a runt. Uh, so I'm not sure I'm gonna introduce it, but I'm definitely using it, in, using it in breeding. It's been a very clean rose for me and I like the form on it. This is another one. This is the whole themia. Again, it has knockout about three or four generations back. Uh, great foliage. So I had to decide uh, not to just select for powdery mildew. Um, 
I love getting black spot. I love getting powdery mildew in my garden. I love getting downy mildew. Although downy is the hardest one to breed against because it's not every year that I get it. Uh, so you might see something that looks resistant and then the next year it's not. Baby seedlings are also, even in their first year, more prone to downy mildew. So it's a little bit tricky with downy mildew. I, every year I hope I just get a little bit, but some years I, I, I can lose some seedlings because of it. Fortunately, I don't get it in the greenhouse and I'm not sure why. So this is kind of my shifting emphasis. What I'm, what, uh, I've brought in some other lines to try to improve some of the cleanliness, including the Will Radler lines. Um, this is Basie's Thornless or Basie's Legacy. And you'll notice there are no thorns on this rose, not even behind the leaves. Does anybody grow this rose? Pardon me? This is either, it's known as Basie's Legacy or Basie's Thornless. It might have another name as well. I, I got my rose from Mr. Moore uh, and it's, some of the breeders use it, but it blooms once. This is the bloom, five petals pink, and it sets hips well, but it, it actually releases the pollen way too early. You can never actually put pollen on it and get across. You have to use its pollen on something else. The petals stay for a day and they're gone, and then you have a ton of hips, and that's what it does. It'll send out some growth, but it, the, the thing that I like about it is it's, it's powdery mildew resistance, doesn't get any. Black spot resistance, excellent. Uh, and the only downside is there's a little bit of rust tendency. And all this baggage of carrying single flowers once blooming forward. Uh, but you can make some progress. And this is one. This is a cross with a Hulthemia. Some of the Basie's thornless one-time blooming rows you cross with others, you can get a few that will do some repeat bloom. And this one did. It has a blotch. It holds its petals longer. It's pretty clean. And I like it. That's first generation. This one was second or third generation. It's still thornless, has a better blotch, no powdery mildew, but it gets black spots. So as you're going down the line, you just have to keep trying to pay attention, keep um, deciding what's gonna carry, are you gonna carry this rose further or not? This one still might be pretty enough to, to let other people grow it, but um, I'm not probably gonna do a lot of breeding with it. This is also a second generation Basie's Thornless. More petals, better color, uh, not quite to form yet, but um, one of its problems, it has a few thorns, so it's not totally thornless, whereas the Holthemia was. Uh, and if you know Tigris, anybody grow Tigris? Tigris has these little hooked thorns that if you get next to it, it's one of those that grabs you. So if you have a sweater on, forget it, you're gonna get caught. And then another one that I've used, uh, Mr. Moore's, uh, he, has, he had some of the Rugosas, and one of him, his that he gave to me was a pink fragrant one that was unnamed, and I call it Mr. Moore's Pink Fragrant Rose, or Rugosa. And this is crossed, uh, it has also some knockout, uh, um, the seedling I crossed it with had some knockout in it, so this one is also extremely clean. Thorny, It is thorny, yeah, so Rugosas are kind of thorny too, yeah. And they also are a tendency to get rust. The only disease I've seen on this is rust. I haven't seen anything else on it. And just a little bit on the, small, the lower petals. And then another uh, place that I've kind of pulled in some, uh, some genetics is from Darlow's Enigma. Isn't that a beautiful rose? I just love this rose. It blooms like crazy. I heard somebody say it smells good. It's very fragrant. Uh, lots and lots and lots of blooms. Uh, so I've used this heavily. It's, I think it's probably diploid. So if you know about the ploidy of rose, roses, most modern roses are trip, tetraploid. That means they have four uh, different copies of each chromosome, two coming from each parent. This one, I'm not positive, but it behaves like a diploid, getting one from each parent. So you cross that with modern roses that even though it sets hips well on its own and that seeds germinate well, when you make crosses, uh, it's a little bit re reluctant to germinate. Uh, nevertheless, there are some pretty roses from that one. And this is one. This is coming from Darlow's Enigma, uh, crossed again with a rose that has background and uh, uh, knockout. Uh, so it's, uh, it's one that I'm liking a lot. 
Um, I'm thinking uh, it might be a good hedge type rose. It grows reasonably tall, um, but it, you can kind of shave it down and it, it just blooms and blooms. One that I've, I've liked and you've all seen it is this next rose. Um, it's on the back of the cover. Uh, thank you to whoever put that there, that was nice. Uh, this is a Darlow's Enigma seedling and it's a Hulthemia. Um, and it's small. So I, I was talking to Bob Martin, his talk on polyanthas. This might actually fit into a polyantha category. Uh, it's being uh, evaluated by Star Roses. Uh, we're going to walk the fields this next week. And I was telling Joan that it's probably going to be a thumbs down from Star Roses uh, just because it, um, uh, when you grow roses in the field for commercial use, it's a field crop. It's not a garden plant. It's not a show rose, it's a field plant. It has to produce, it has to root well, it has to bloom well, it has to look great. This one blooms really nice in the spring, kind of peters out a little bit and has some other blooms here and there, but it just doesn't keep the bloom cycle going. So moving on to the procedure, as I like to call it. Um, these are my pollens. And you can see that most of them are labeled with letters and numbers. Uh, I saw some flower girls on the tables today. And that, I've used that in the past, and, I, and I, I love that rose. And I've just started using it again this last year. So FG, as you can see on the lower right, is flower girl. And then in the back middle, KO is knockout. FM is Francis Mayon. And so there's different ones here and there, but most of them are seedlings that I'll use. They're nice if you decide to do this. They're kind of nice. You can stack the cups when you go out to the garden and then I unstack them and I put them on our fireplace. My wife loves that. <laughs> to let the pollen dry and then uh, you can take them back out the next day. Here's a pollen cup um, with a code name. These are, this is how I name the roses uh, with a code name. I, used the, I, I adopted Tom Caruso's uh, 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 naming convention and that is you the first digit is a letter. That's the year you were in the greenhouse. So this is my P year uh, for this pollen. Um, I don't remember how many letters that is, but it's quite a few. Right now I'm on the T year actually. Uh, and then the, they're numbered based on where they are in the seedling bench. I put little codes like DK there to remind me that this has double knockout in it uh, so that I'll, I'll remember this uh, better. And so the procedure itself, here's a rose that I think many of you like. It's Gemini. I apologize, this is not the exhibition form you're used to, uh, but I, this was the day I decided I was going to take some photos of the hybridizing procedure. And the important thing is you have to select the rose when it's at about exhibition stage. You want it, uh, depending on the number of petals, uh, cer certainly single petaled roses, you're going to want to uh, get them the day before they're going to open because they will release their pollen early. Uh, with bigger roses, you have a little bit more leeway, but you do want to make sure the center is kind of soft when you squeeze it, and then you'll be able to emasculate it. So the hard part is you've got to rip off all those petals. So here it is. I, I usually leave two petals on the rose so that um, I can separate it from those that have been pollinated yesterday. This is the one I'm going to pollinate today. So as you probably all know, the anatomy of the rose, the center part is the stigma. Uh, that's the female part that will make the seeds. The anthers uh, or stamens uh, are on the outside part. They have those little pollen sacs. And they have to be removed so you don't have uh, self-pollination when you want to introduce another pollen. So that's with all of the anthers removed. Um, I have pollen on my finger. I'm applying the pollen. And what I've learned, I've seen some people pollinate with just a ton of pollen. And those little solo cups, the cool thing about those is you can just kind of flick them with your finger. Uh, the pollen kind of scatters. You can get a little bit on your finger. And there are hundreds and hundreds of grains on a little bit of dust. So you can achieve a good pollination. I also just pollinate once. A lot of people do it twice. They'll pollinate today and tomorrow. Uh, to me, that's just too much work. I've, I've tried to make it easy. Gemini, for those of you that like hybrid teas or Floribundas, it's a great rose for form, a great rose for those two types. Um, it has 
it tends to produce larger blooms in its seedlings than most, ro most roses that I've used when I'm looking for hybrid teas. And uh, it has, as you know, it has fragrance, it has a great form. Um, it's just a pretty rose. In fact, I, I cannot take the petals off without smelling it because it's, it's so fragrant. And then the next step is taking off the petals and putting on a tag. So once the tag's on, it's been identified with the pollen parent and you move on. And this next picture, this is a, a beauty to behold for a hybridizer. I have lots of hips that are forming. Very exciting. This is the plant of Gemini. And so moving on from there, um, when you first do this, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very difficult to wait for the hips to, to mature. Um, you want to just get them opened and plant the seeds, uh, but you really do need to wait at least 90 days, um, and I, I prefer waiting four months. Uh, after four months, you take them out of the hip, uh, you put them in a Ziploc bag, get a little squirt of water, put them in the refrigerator, leave them there for, if you can, uh, up to 10 to 12 weeks, um, and then they'll have that artificial winter that helps to promote germination. So this is after all of that happened. So the maturing of the hip, the picking the, the seeds, and so on. And we're getting ready to plant here. And as you'll notice, this is dark potting soil. It's flat. We've got some measuring sticks. And you saw my sons out there uh, planting uh, in one of the earlier photos. I learned from Mr. Moore that you have to um, ideally put something on the surface to uh, inhibit uh, damp off. If you've seen damp off in your vegetable garden or some of your annuals if you plant seeds, it's devastating for roses. In fact, uh, just a little aside, when we first got to this property, uh, one of my mentors was Joe Winchell. And if you know Joe, he planted all of his seeds outside. Uh, it, was, it was really neat. He could plant them out there, they grow, and his climate was such that he could do that. For whatever reason, I tried that. I had 20,000 seeds our first year at this house. I planted them outside, they grew, they looked like a lawn almost. There were so many germinations. And then all of a sudden, really quickly, damp off hit. And I think I ended up with about 200 little seedlings that survived damp off. And I decided then I have to have a greenhouse, I have to have the protection. So, and that was a good choice. Uh, it's re it really allowed me to uh, produce a lot more seed seedlings. And th this is just about 10 weeks later. Um, you can see them, they've grown well, they're blooming well. Roses are, um, I, I, I'm interested in orchids, but I don't know whether I have the patience for hybridizing orchids. And I don't have the equipment, uh, a hood and all the sterile stuff and the auger and all that that you have to use. So roses are easy, so try it. You plant the seeds, eight to 10 weeks, you get some blooms. It's really, really neat. Uh, this next photo is of a, of a rose that I decided to try um, uh, as a parent. Every year what I'll do is I'll select some of my seedlings that are producing good hips. And my question is, can this be used in breeding? The first step is to see, well, do they germinate? Do the seeds germinate? A lot of roses have almost 0% germination, which is extremely disappointing for a person that's starting out. That's why you want to have your mentors. You want to use Gemini if you have it. And there's a lot of others that you can use as well. And this one, the mom of this rose, germinates well, sets hips well. But I learned it uh, a couple years ago that it, it actually germinated well. These are all sister seedlings. They're all from an open pollinated batch of hips. And you can see the diversity. And this is what excites me. If you, I mean, just look at the petals. Do you see a few colors? Look at the anthers. Look at the filaments. Some, some filaments are white, some are yellow, some are black. Uh, there's some that have the blotch. Uh, the mom is a holthemia. There's some that don't have the blotch. So just the diversity to me is just incredible, which is what makes this so exciting to do. This is one of the better ones of that group. A great blotch. Uh, I like anthers. I hope you do too. Um, and then the next one is another one that I've, uh, this one I probably am going to introduce, whether the, it gets commercial or not. I, it, um, I think it can show. It's, uh, it has a good blotch, it, uh, stable in the summertime, and so on. This rose I was really hopeful of last year. It's a cross of um, 
uh, singing in the rain with a mixture of some clean stuff on another side. And it seemed to be quite clean. I was hoping that it would be a, a larger hybrid tea. I'm not sure it's going to make it. This is another one that I, uh, it's, a two, it's two years ago that this was showed up in the greenhouse. Does anybody grow blue for you? Yes. Is it clean? Yeah. No. It isn't? I hope it is. <laughs> it, in my garden, it is clean. It doesn't get any uh, powdery mildew. It doesn't get any black spot. Um, and this one has blue for you on one side. And then um, it has another uh, good blotched uh, seedling on the other side. But it just blooms like crazy, uh, and, and it tends to hold its, its petals long enough that you could actually show it. The last one here that I'm going to show about uh, the Hothemis before we move to talking about the RHA uh, is probably the last uh, Hothemia that Star Roses is going to introduce, um, maybe in a couple, two or three years. It's, it's, it is by far the best one. I, I, I like to make apologies profusely for the earlier Iconics. Uh, uh, they were excited because uh, there weren't any out there when uh, they started looking at mine. Uh, but certainly the, the European breeders um, have been doing this for a long time. So um, the RHA, uh, we have several members here. I know Joan is. I know Bob is. Bob's a, a regional uh, director. Gail is. Um, and then I think there's a few others. I, Baldo, are you? And uh, Marion? Rosemary, I'm sorry. Yes. And uh, anyway, you're invited to join. Uh, it's, uh, I have some newsletters here, and I have uh, backup newsletters. You can purchase these. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can, you're welcome to take a copy of the newsletter. Um, but the membership is $10 if you want a, a copy like that four times a year. It's eight bucks if you just want digital. Uh, and it's a good group. Uh, there, we're international. You get a lot of information. There's a forum and so on. So I think that's my plug. Uh, so what about the future of roses? Where are we going? Are you happy with the size of the societies? No. Me neither. Um, I know the rose growers are not happy with the number of roses that they're selling, way fewer than 20 years ago. So I think really the future of roses is that we really, really have to play, pay attention to cleanliness. How many of you like to spray your rose gardens? Is anybody? I mean, some of us are, I mean, I'm a little OCD and I think some of us are, and that kind of plays into it, and you know, but. Really, you know, maybe you'd rather fertilize, maybe you'd rather weed. There's always something to do in the rose garden. Who wants to spray? So they, they really need to be much cleaner, not just for us, but for the people that we're going to attract to roses. They don't want to have to spray. What about color va variations? Uh, I, I think there's a lot of color variations that, are, that can come even through the Hothemias. I've seen uh, the blotch that extends down the center of the petal looks like almost like a stripe, but it's in the middle of the petals instead of being random. Uh, there's some that almost have uh, a, a, like a rainbow. You know, when you see a double rainbow, there's a band and then there's another band. So some of the Hothemias are like that. Uh, what I'm waiting for is a blotch that's on the reverse. I, I thought it would be really cool to have a hybrid tea that had a blotch on the reverse, you know, so you see the thing. And, but I haven't seen it yet, so anyway. That's the imagination. I have to keep thinking about that. Um, and what about a uh, blue rose? We need more floriferousness. They need to be more continuous. Uh, I know that we're OK if we get the rose show in the springtime, but it's way better if we can have roses that keep coming on, uh, keep blooming, and have more flowers, uh, which is why I like Darlow's Indigma. There's, it just is covered with blooms, and uh, the polyanthas are like that as well. Floribundas are my favorite, uh, and I think most people want to see blooms. And then what about the future of the societies? What do we need to do? So, you know, I, I, I would love to see a section of low maintenance roses. And that would include whatever is low maintenance here. You know, certainly if knockout is not and you have to spray for powdery mildew and rust, 
that wouldn't qualify, but there are others that would. And those are the roses that the newbies, the people that come to the rose shows, really need to get their hands on and get their feet wet and start growing roses. Uh, we, we still need to have the other ones. I'm not suggesting to eliminate those, but uh, this is the way to get people involved. Help them find a way to make it easy. Those are my thoughts with hybridizing roses. We have to find a way to make it easy, not hard. Um, I know Berling talked about uh, propagating roses, and she did a great job talking about how that's easy as well and, and how people can be encouraged. And I think uh, low-maintenance roses would do that. Another thing that uh, I actually heard in, uh, there was a, the Federation of Rose Societies in Texas, Houston, was it? Somewhere? Anyway, I went to one of these, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe further back, and Frank Bernardella was talking about what they do in England. They, they'll often have large sprays and uh, more representation of the plant. Um, it does need to be groomed, it needs to be pretty, but there's, mu there's more of what the plant looks like. And I think that would also be helpful to new growers. So anyway, these are my thoughts. Um, I, I've, I've, they're not only my thoughts, but they're the ones that I've adopted. I think that they are, um, hopefully in our future, I think they would be important. So some other roses in our future. Just, I'm gonna close with, uh, with a few of these. Um, this is one of my favorite Huthemias that passes on great stamens. Uh, my ideal Huthemia in my imagination is probably 10 to 15 petals. That one has it. Uh, I like this one as well. Uh, it has some variation, white with a red center, but it ages to a pink with a red center, and so you get some uh, variation in the, in the bloom effect on it. And my dream would be a knockout that looked like this. <laughs> now, this is one of my seedlings. It's not a knockout but it's uh, certainly getting closer than some of the roses. This is my favorite Floribunda. It's not been named or introduced yet, but um, I have my fingers crossed. And then finally, you know, that's one of my seedlings. Really? It is, and heavily Photoshopped. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, I have to tell you though about, it's, Two or three weeks ago, and I don't dream a lot about roses, so I, please don't think I'm strange, but I was dreaming about blue roses. And, uh, and I had always thought that blue roses really weren't, you know, I, I was imagining like that red rose I just showed you, a blue rose that was solid dark blue. And for some reason I could not make my mind think that was gonna be pretty. Um, in my dream, the blue roses, there were two, two seedlings, they were blue, and they were light blue. They were pure blue. They were a, a pretty blue. And this is as close as I could get. This doesn't quite match it. But it was, they were beautiful roses. I think blue roses are in our future, and I think they will be pretty. And I hope I get to see them someday. Um, so this is my favorite rose, and this is closing. And I have to leave you with the Kaiser theme. May you live long and thrive. And thank you. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So the question is, what about fragrant roses? And it's true, everybody wants a rose to smell good. Do any of you not sniff a rose that you're gonna buy? I do, I, and, and my seedlings. If, uh, when I'm thinking about throwing out a seedling that's kind of 50-50, I smell it first, and if it smells good, I keep it for a little bit longer. So I think everybody's got that message. Fragrance really has to come back to roses. The, the problem is that, um, in fact, when I first started this, I, I, got, got, I bought Sheer Bliss, Double Delight, Fragrant Cloud, you know, just all the hybrid teas at the time that were fragrant. And it turns out that um, there's a strong powdery mildew tendency in the fragrant roses. It's not 100%, but there is that challenge. So you, ha you have to select for it. Delish is out there, you might have heard of that one. And of course, Gemini is very fragrant. Uh, I think people are doing that. Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond? Is that pretty fragrant? fragrant yeah. yeah. I've heard of the rose, but I haven't tried it yet. You know, and if this was a smaller room, I'd ask each of you, what is your favorite 
very floriferous and clean rose. I want to know. Um, I, I would like, love to learn that because that's, that's what we need to do is bring that in. Fragrant cleanliness and floriferousness, those things. Anything else? For me? Iceberg, yes. That's a lot of people's f favorite rose. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you.